Hi, and welcome to Deep Green Productions. In this interview, we're talking with Dark Journalist. His website is darkjournalist.com, and if you have any interest in UFOs or the JFK assassination or secret government technologies or media cover-ups, then darkjournalist.com is probably one of the websites you really need to check out. Not only does he have a lot of interesting topics there, uh, but he also has some very interesting people that he talks to. And it's a real pleasure to have him on. Hello, DJ. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be here, Deck. Thank you. One of the interesting people I was referring to uh, was Catherine Austin Fitz. She's quite a lady. For people who don't know, Catherine Austin Fitz is the former uh, assistant housing secretary under Bush one. But a lot of people don't know she also worked under the Clinton administration. Uh, and she basically had this long career on Wall Street before that. So she knows those corridors of power better than almost anyone. And for her to have come out the way that she did and tell us about how that structure worked in the 90s up to the 2000s is really valuable, I think. And you don't, there's almost no example of it anywhere. So her work, uh, I think at a certain point, you know, we, we start to say that's the standard by which you can judge a lot of the other economic reporting. Um, because, of course, she has a very successful financial practice now as a financial expert and investment advisor. But basically, um, what she's saying is that there's two systems going on simultaneously. And there's a public system going on financially that we see and that we read about in Bloomberg and things like that. And then there's a second system of finance that happens. And that second system involves the black budget. And the black budget is a mechanism that military and intelligence came up with initially in order to run operations uh, that were kind of off the books, that would help the country. And this dates back to the Cold War when we needed to do things like that. And uh, there were a lot of excesses, and not a lot of checks and balances. But the question, when it arose in Congress, sometimes these guys would get very out of hand with what they were doing. And there'd be a congressional committee look into it temporarily. There were plenty of them in the 80s. But the question, you know, the answer always came back from those questions. Well, it's in the interest of national security that we're doing this. And so they were allowed to build the system. There's actually a very classic article that comes out of a Detroit, uh, the Detroit newspaper in the late 80s, I'd say 1986. And they did the first comprehensive article on the black budget. And uh, what they deduced at the time was that it was about $50 billion then. So it grew uh, you know, exponentially over the next 20 years with 9-11 with Iran-Contra, uh, with the derivatives, you know, so this whole structure is now massive, and now the black budget is operating side by side with our regular public budget. And, you know, we hear politicians go back and forth, and they're talking about, well, you know, Medicare cuts or, like, increasing the military. Well, let me tell you, that kind of money is nothing compared to what the black budget is operating with. And uh, so the political battles that we see on the surface are really just scuffles hiding this kind of deeper system of finance. And that's where I think uh, Fitz's work is so valuable. She talks a lot about uh, enormous sums of money. Um, I've heard in some of her interviews. Um, I'm yeah. just wondering <laughs> why nobody else that I've come across in that arena uh, seems, to, seems to note that. Is it the case that they simply don't know about the, the enormous budget? Well, I think that one thing that uh, Catherine has working for her is that she really knows how the operations work and how to add the operations and the costs together. So, for example, you know, there was this famous incident, which is called the Phoenix Lights, that happened in 1997, where these crafts were seen over the uh, city of Phoenix, and that was reported in, you know, New York Times, and a lot of the major media picked it up. And it was just a strange flap. Nobody quite understood it. The governor himself came out and said, you know, I've never seen anything that size. What are, what are these crafts? And I couldn't get any answers from the military. So what she decided to do was figure out how much it would cost for Boeing to put that thing together. And when she started to look at the missing trillions of dollars, she started to add the two together and say, well, they could probably build something like that for $4 trillion, for example. So the missing money uh, that has popped up out of the military, it's not just the military. It's money that's missing out of the Pentagon, 
out of NASA, out of HUD, you know, a number of different agencies. Uh, and that's all in the American government. If you go globally, of course, there's a lot of different countries like in the UK where you'll find the very same conditions. So it's certainly not just a US problem. But it's this it's the secondary system. Now, this is the thing that Peter Dale Scott, who we had a, an episode with Peter Dale Scott on the deep state. And Professor Scott is a Berkeley professor who was a Canadian diplomat. And he's been studying these things for years. And uh, he came up with the term the deep state, which you kind of hear a little bit about now. But what it is basically is that, you know, there's a secondary state that's operating outside of the public state. And it has its own checks and balances. And it has its own mechanisms, and even its own kind of secondary government. And it's that system that's operating, which, you know, there's so many things that the public system can't account for when it steps in. So we have big mysteries in our past in American history, or oh, the JFK assassination, 9-11, you know, these different various incidents that happen. And, uh, you know, some of the Iraq war, the, the forces behind it, and this whole system, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union, there are so many things that are operating underneath that we don't get to see. And we get these kind of very superficial renderings in the media because the media is the biggest blog because the media is all corporate and state funded. So, you know, it, it's not very likely we're going to get the truth out of them anytime soon. Uh, I think one of my favorite things to go back on this account and look at is public television. You know, they do these specials on uh, JFK once in a while. And uh, you have Doris Kearns Goodwin, you know, one of the historians. She comes out and she says, well, you know, JFK, he was raised in a very strict atmosphere, but he was kind of a prankster and he had a lust for life. And it's just, you know, things that don't mean anything. It doesn't help the public understand the problem, you know. And so when we go back there and we think of it as a coup, you know, you think of it as one side, which was the military industrial complex and the intelligence complex fighting against the political side. And the political side lost when they removed JFK. So, you know, later on, they removed Kennedy, uh, his brother, RFK, uh, Martin Luther King. So if you were really to have an accurate rendering of 60s history, you'd look at it as one side fighting another side and this other side winning. That's an interesting perspective. I hadn't heard that one before. Shifting gears a little bit, um, one thing I haven't heard Catherine talk about much is the nature of collapse. Seems to be on everybody's lips these days. Do you know what her position is? Yeah, well, she's been really famous for uh, talking about the slow burn economy. That is where they slowly devalue the money that you have. And she has, you know, great research and charts and everything else on the financial side. But I think by avoiding that trap of making predictions, this is going to crash here and this is going to go down, the thing that she has is an understanding that, you know, the, the black budget fuels a lot of the regular economy so that when they come into real big trouble, they can call on these assets, this other system, to come in and cover these losses and to keep things steady where they want it to be steady. It's not an infinite process. You know, they, they can get into trouble too. But one of the reasons I think that we're seeing uh, these predictions not come true and the, the hyperinflation never happens. You've been hearing about that. I mean, I, I remember since being a teenager, I've been hearing about this. Uh, and we always hear, you know, oh, your dollar isn't going to be worth anything. And, and uh, these guys, and these are good economists, actually. And they're honest guys and, and they really believe it. Uh, well, there's there's a few fear mongers out there. I, I, I shouldn't say they all are, believe it, but certainly a good number of them are, are uh, telling us that. And what they're drawing on is their research based on the public information that's available. So I think one of the things that Catherine in her work can do, and also I think there's a few other people out there. I'd mentioned Joseph Farrell on this count also, um, who's a you know, an author and a researcher who talks a lot about that secret system of finance and how it was born back in the post-World War II period. Um, you know, basically what they are able to do is draw on that system that we can't look at, that we can't get our fingers on, that we can't get the records on. And, you know, that kind of history just doesn't exist at the library. You're not going to find it in the 401, the uh, the reports that they file at the end of the year. You know, it's not that kind of a thing. So you have to have people who understand that world to be able to go in there and dissect it. 
I'd say. And uh, no, I don't think we're going to see a dollar crash, although I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't have a rocky road between here and, say, when uh, the election happens in 2016. 2016. I heard one blogger suggest that uh, martial law would be declared by then and uh, the elections probably wouldn't happen. Have you heard anything about that? Uh, no, I haven't run across that one, but I've heard this before, uh, and it specifically seems like around Obama people think this, because there is something unusual about Obama and some of the things that, that he's done while he's been in office, and they think, well, maybe he's trying to hang on to power, you know. Yeah. Um, I never think that these forces that operate under the regular system that you and I live in on a day-to-day -day basis, those forces don't like to be very obvious. They like to operate stealth. They're not going to stop an election. That would alert everybody that something yeah. is wrong. Yeah. Plus, yeah. They, they know how to get their guys in, so why would they want to stop it? Sure. sure. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think that that's uh, anything on the horizon. You know, Even with the best guests that I have on the show, that's not something that, that they've been talking about either. I think more what we're talking about and, and maybe the risk for the period that we're in is this great centralization. You know, So you're talking about the centralization of money the heavy digitization of our wallet, you know, so that everything goes to this digital system, digital money, and we are at the mercy of these electronic systems. Now, there's a very interesting article, actually, on uh, GizaDeathStar.com, which is Farrell's website. And Farrell's been a guest on the show. We, we have about four episodes with him. And one of the things that he talked about in that article, it's very new and it's very interesting. It's about how they are moving a lot of these data processes into space by satellites. And, you know, there's been a lot of questions about the secret space program and what's it, what is it for, because we know NASA can't even go back to the moon at this point. They have problems even doing that. So what, what is the secret space program? What is it built for? And people say, well, you know, they're trying to colonize other planets. Well, maybe it's something else. Uh, and we, you know, space weapons, that comes up also. But I think one of the things that they're trying to do might be related to this article. And the article basically said if they move these processes of data mining and holding data in space by these satellites, then they can enlist the Air Force to protect that data. So then you're, you're free from hackers here on Earth. You know, we know it's a very connected system. But you're also free from congressional oversight. So the opportunities for money laundering, et cetera, become vast. And I think that that's something to watch out for far more than uh, an election that, that won't be held. Fair enough. Uh, going back in time, do you or do any of your guests have a starting point for any of this stuff? I've heard it go back to ancient Egypt as being a starting point and bring it forward. Uh, people can tag the... Um, the development of the Federal Reserve as being a starting point. Other people posit the Kennedy assassination as a starting point. Do you have a sense for when uh, this might have started? I, I do like to chart things from the Kennedy assassination because that's the modern wave. Yeah. There are steps. There are steps of consolidation over time, uh, especially the Federal Reserve Act, of course. I mean, I think that's a gigantic centralization of the entire financial process, and it guarantees that we're going to be, you know, we won't issue debt-free money. Uh, and if you go back to ancient times, you're going to find that part of the secrecy that we see now has its roots, actually, in, in that period of time. Because what happened was, in those days, those secret societies would hold information. You know, They'd hold information about technology. They'd hold the religious questions. Uh, so that's a real you know, incredible string if you go back that far. It's an amazing thing about the uh, the name of America, you know, the country, America, actually. Well, when I was in school, they always told us it was Amerigo Vespucci, and it was named after him. It was an Italian explorer, and, you know, they thought, well, you know, this made sense. And uh, it, it turns out, if you research that story, actually, that America gets its name from a secret society, oh, yeah. which, the ten yeah, and that's, that's an Essene... Uh, an offshoot of the Essenes, which were uh, around during the time of Christ. And they were a very interesting group that studied esoteric, uh, you know, numerology, astrology, and esoteric concepts. And it's very interesting slice there, but their homeland, their place they were going to, this star was called America. Yeah. And that's where the name, the root of the name is. And the Templars kept that. And they actually uh, became a big 
force for naming it America in the beginning. And uh, actually, the report where the guy, you know, there was a monk who recorded this at the time. He was like, he just assumed it was Amerigo Vespucci. And then later he wrote, oh, no, it wasn't. I was mistaken, you know. So even that, you can see how these truths just stick around um, because who in the official structure wants to say we were founded by a secret society? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it makes people ask questions, and uh, very often, if you're in the official structure, you really don't want people asking questions. Uh, it, it leads to other questions, and it might open up all kinds of opportunities and possibilities. The best thing to do if you're in power is keep people on a very limited mental track. You know, let them think about their day-to-day -day cares and forget about the larger picture uh, and, and deprive them of the tools that you know, they could have to actually expose some of the control tools that you're using. Sure. Uh, so, you know, if you're in power, that, that's what you want to do. In a recent interview you did with Paul Hellyer, the former defense minister from Canada, the two of you talked about reverse engineering of alien technology. I'm wondering if we've seen anything result from that process. Well, a lot of people who get into this question about reverse engineering, uh, I do ask them, what, you know, what do we have now that is a result of that? A lot of them do say it's stealth technology, um, you know, and, and that whole origin of it. Uh, others have pointed to, there's a fabulous book called The Day After Roswell, which is by um, a retired intelligence officer named Philip Corso. And Corso is a very interesting guy, came out just before he died and talked about how he was in charge of reverse engineering these craft from the 40s. So the crashes happened in the late 40s. And uh, he, he ascribed all kinds of um, developments that we had, such as the microchip and Kevlar, you know, bulletproof vests and, and a lot of military equipment. And Velcro. So, yeah, Velcro, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, I see you've read that book. It's a good book, and I always recommend it. You know, people say, well, we don't know if Corso was telling the truth, etc., my feeling about Corso is that he, he really had no reason to lie, and that was the end of his life, and he seemed like he really just wanted to get the truth out there. So, you know, I feel like there are a lot of answers there, uh, because he was in the foreign technology division, and that's the division where they were reverse engineering these craft. We can only imagine if, you know, if they've had these developments, let's think about this, 60 years, 65 years somewhere in that range. They've been reverse engineering that technology. And, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty smart to start with. I mean, even in the 40s, we had pretty good scientists and pretty good developments. And, uh, you know, we've gone to the moon and everything else since then. We certainly have been able to extract a lot of secrets. I don't know that we can handle the technology. I, I don't think it's a perfect blend yet. I still think that they have a lot to learn which is why they, they love to uh, cover up the UFO reality and they, they love to ridicule it in the press because there's so many secrets there as far as the kind of technology that we could be using on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that would ha have all kinds of, you know, be quite a threat to the petroleum-based economies that we're on. So certainly they have pretty good reasons for keeping that stuff secret. Sure. There might have been a time when we could assume that that information was being withheld for our own good but I think a lot of that goodwill has been erased. Uh, how do you think we as citizens might reclaim some of our authority, get the answers to some of these things? Well, it's a good question. It's a really good question. Uh, I think the first thing to do is to, you know, think of us as a global citizenry. And, you know, it's, it's not going to work to just think what's one small part of one country that's going to do something. We do have this kind of incredible technology that allows us to be connected now, and uh, it is good if we can somehow integrate that and become a sort of central force ourselves. But mostly, it's about, you know, starving the beast. <laughs> so it's starving the data beast. Um, you know, if you don't agree with a bank, for example, that is tied into uh, the kind of deals that saw the crash of 2008, and allowed a lot of people to be thrown out of their homes with mortgage fraud and things like that, Bank of America comes to mind, um, then don't do business with them. You know, I think that that's the first real solid thing that you can do. And, you know, sort of divorcing yourself from that reality of people who, and businesses, 
corporations that are really harvesting your assets and harvesting your life, you know. And uh, if their goal is to, you know, sort of extract more and more of your wealth and send it up top to the 1% or the 10% of the 1%, uh, then it's probably high time to start looking at ways, and there are all sorts of ways you can do this. Um, I think one of the easiest things to do is to, you know, not invest yourself in large-scale uh, corporate stores like Walmart, for example, um, where they don't treat their their workers well anyway. We know that. Yeah. So I think that a lot of these companies really need the shock to the system, and uh, it would be really good if you know people started to frown upon. You know, if these companies look. They just removed aspartame from Pepsi from Diet Pepsi. Now, why did they do that? We know that aspartame is a toxin, and aspartame has caused all sorts of health problems for years. So the question is, why did Pepsi make a move on it now? And I largely attribute it to the possibility of the alternative media pushing the question up so much that the awareness grew, just like you're seeing GMO awareness grew. You know, uh, it's growing fast, and the awareness around GMOs is forcing companies like Monsanto to have bad quarters as far as their financial earnings are concerned. So this is the power of the alternative media um, getting the word out and making the right choices, that's obviously uh, the, the first step that we all make, but it's being aware. In other words, if I have the knowledge of something, if I understand that I'm not getting the truth from a corporate news organ, you know, if I'm watching the news on CNN and I realize it's a, it's a corporation that's controlling it, and it's a series of corporations like Ford, like GE, that have input, then I have to look at it differently. I have to say what they're telling me isn't the truth. And that's been proven over and over again. That's a big realization. And that's a big start. And then you, you start from there. So I'd say that's, that's really step one. It's, it's the media. It's seeing through the media. That's an interesting way to look at it. But sadly, that's all the time we have for this journey into the dark side. I'd like to thank our guest, the dark journalist, Daniel. Thanks very much for spending time with us today and sharing your views. Before we let you go, perhaps you could share with the audience just how they might be able to get a hold of more dark matter. Thanks so much, Deck, and uh, I really appreciate it. The site is www.darkjournalist.com. And for people uh, looking forward to the schedule in May, we have shows with Linda Moulton Howe and Paul Hillier coming up for May, so stay tuned on those. Excellent. I know I'll be watching. 